So this morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Matthew. So if you will open up to Matthew chapter 19, please. So this morning I'm going to step on some toes. Um, I hope you left all the tomatoes and things in the back room so I don't have to be dodging stuff, right? No. You know, there are things that we do as we go through the Bible verse by verse that are really fun and very inspiring, very educational. Uh, it helps in our spiritual growth. And then there are some things that we study because we do go verse by verse that are sometimes hard. So this morning, maybe depending on what side of this message you're going to find yourself, it could be hard or it could be a blessing. It could be confirming to you or it could be convicting to you. But we're going to do it nevertheless. So um, let's look at chapter 19. Let's begin at verse 1. And if you just follow me down, we're going, to, we're going to read several verses down through here. It says that it came to pass when Jesus finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea upon, uh, beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and he said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives. From the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. We'll stop right there. Woo! So, you know, it's, it's really something to think that, uh, you know, Jesus has been doing all of these really, really awesome teachings encouraging teachings, uh, educating his disciples, and uh, giving them so many different kinds of examples. And as we segue into uh, chapter 19, we find that he crosses over the Jordan River uh, from the area of Galilee. He crosses over into the area of uh, Judea, which today is modern-day Jordan. And um, so he's on the other side of the river now, and he begins to see the people who literally followed him across the river. How many of you know that everywhere that Jesus went, people followed him? Everywhere Jesus went, people wanted to be near him. Everywhere he went, they had needs that they wanted him to meet. And so when we read here, as we have over and over again in Matthew, it tells us that great multitudes followed him, and he got so impatient that he sent them all home. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. It says he healed them there. He didn't send anybody home. He never does that, does he? He's the good shepherd. And he comes and he heals the multitude, not just a multitude, but a great multitude. But also, if you look in verse 3, you also see another dynamic here that takes place all through the gospel. The Pharisees followed him also. You know, the enemy is always going to be on your tail. He's always going to be following you. You can have some really great experiences, spiritual experiences, growth experiences in the Lord. You can study God's Word and learn and be so blessed by that. And you head out, and you know what? The enemy is always going to be chasing. He's always going to show up 
You can cross over the river thinking that you're maybe out of his area. No, he'll cross the river too. And this is what we see happening. These are the enemies of Christ. These are the ones who are out to get him, to destroy him, much like our adversary, the devil. And so they thought, you know what, this is a good opportunity to trap Jesus in order to find something uh, doctrinally wrong that we can accuse him of, because they're out to get him now. They're, They're done with him prospering. They're done with his popularity. They want it to end. They are threatened by him. And it's really, really a sad thing when you think about what this really is. This is the religious leadership of Israel who are afraid of the very Messiah that they've been waiting for for thousands of years. Wow, how can that even be? But we know that they did not recognize him. They did not know who he was, even though he told them and he proved it to them over and over again. So they come because they're smart. They're, they're lawyers of the Mosaic law, if you will. And so they come and ask him a question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? If she scrambles your eggs wrong, out the door, right? Burn your steak, out the door. Don't make the bed right, out the door. I make my own bed. I do my own laundry. So she keeps me around. I mean, 42 years, that's pretty good, don't you think? She got me trained. So anyway, these guys come. We don't know how many there are, but there's a little contingency of them, you know. They kind of move together, you know, wherever they go. They, you know, you see them moving around. And they come, and they're going to trap Jesus now, because here's the thing, they know the cultural setting. They know that these people have been under the influence of Roman rule and Roman law for a long time. And if you know anything about the Romans, you know that they were ultra liberal. Anything goes, right? They didn't have the values that the Bible would teach. They didn't have the morals that the Bible would teach. And every time we find ourselves living in the midst of an environment like that, it's real easy for it to seep into our lives too. It's real easy for us to become like the environment that we're living in. That's why we always have to be careful as believers to keep our eyes out, to find out, you know, be a watchman on the wall. Because we are living in a culture right now where pretty much anything goes. And this topic that we're talking about this morning, this is not a topic that would be readily accepted in that culture out there. But it was the same during Jesus' time. So the people themselves who are gathered there listening to this dialogue going on, that's who the Pharisees really want to get to. They want to turn them on Jesus. And they think that, you know what, whatever answer he gives to this question, he's going to be in trouble because there's going to be someone who doesn't agree with him. So they ask the question, can you divorce a person for any reason, a woman, your wife, your husband? And Jesus reminds them. Of course, he refers back to the book of Genesis, and he talks about how God made them male and female, uh, and for this reason, a father and the mother, his father and mother, he will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. They are joined together, and they become one flesh. I don't hear a whole lot of that when it comes to marriages these days, you know. It seems like a lot of people kind of, they want their own individuality within their relationship, within their marriage, and people don't, for the most part, they don't understand what they're entering into when they take these vows of marriage with one another. As a matter of fact, part of the problem, I think, is that a lot of people, when they get married, they're not walking with the Lord. Neither is the spouse. Neither one of them know the Lord, perhaps. Maybe they're just out in the world, and they meet somebody, and they fall in love, and they want to get married because it's the right thing to do. But they really don't have a relationship with God, and the Bible doesn't really direct their paths. And so they kind of enter into this 
holy matrimony, if you will, in kind of an unholy way because they don't even know the Lord. I kind of wonder sometimes how God feels about that as he sees those folks doing those vows and making those vows together, but they have no clue about why they're doing it. Now, Paul tells us some really awesome things in his writings concerning husbands and wives. As a matter of fact, he makes a correlation between husbands and wives and Jesus and the church. As a matter of fact, he says that marriage is actually a picture of Jesus and the church. He says that the wife represents the bride. Who's the bride? The church. And the husband, he represents Christ. He's the head. He represents Jesus. I hear some of you gals thinking right now, he ain't my head. I'm in charge of my own life, you know. I'm independent and strong, all these kinds of things. And that's, you know, that's pretty normal. But would you feel comfortable, ladies, if Jesus were to come and say, I want to be your husband, and you would say, I will submit to you in any area you would ask because I trust that you have my best interest at heart. You'll never ask me to do something that isn't a blessing. That's true about Jesus, isn't it? And it should be true about us guys, too, in our marriage relationships. Our wives should have confidence in us to know that you're never going to ask her to embark upon a journey of which she doesn't want to go, no matter what it might be. If it's going to hurt her or damage her spiritually or emotionally, then us guys, it's our job to be the protector. It's our job to be the one who hovers over her. It's our job to say, you know what? I had an agenda when I was single. I could go out with anyone. I could go anywhere. I could do anything I want to do. But because I love this person so much, I'm willing to forfeit that, that privilege of freedom, if you will. I'm, I'm willing to forfeit that and give all my devotion to this one person. I'm willing to die to myself in order to be with my bride, much like what Jesus did for us. Beautiful picture. That's what a marriage should reflect. Very rare, very seldom do you really see that uh, working itself out uh, in, in many marriages today. And, and I know that a lot of us in here this morning that are married, this message is going to, um, it's going to touch us. And then there's some of us who have been married before, and it didn't work out. And now, we're married again. And you're reading this, and you're going, oh my God, I'm on my way to hell. From all, you know, from first glance, you would think, Wow. I thought we were saved by grace. I thought that was the blood of Jesus that covered me from, for all, you know, washed away my sin. And here now I'm worried because, boy, I'm, I'm on my way to the pit, you know. So we're going to address that this morning too because I know that that happens a lot. I think that, you know, one of the things I feel is that God is a very merciful, gracious, and understanding creator. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knew when you entered into that covenant relationship that it wasn't going to work out. He knew it already. You didn't surprise him when you guys said, I can't live with you anymore. I'm out of here. You burnt my toast one too many times. And, you know, things are starting to sag. Uh, I, I need to tr trade you in for a new model. I want to get the new electric model. Right? Instead of the gas-powered model. Uh, yeah. But that's the culture we live in today. If it gets old, just replace it. Right? <laughs> it's good to know that none of us fall in that category this morning. So the Lord, the first thing He does here, He doesn't just come out and say yes or no. He doesn't answer them by saying, yeah, you can divorce her for any reason. Moses said you could do that, so that's cool. 
He doesn't do that. Immediately, he goes to the Scripture. Immediately, he goes to God's Word to give them the answer. And I'll tell you something, you guys. You can always find the answer to your question, whatever it might be, in His Word. And when you do, you want to hang on to it because it's His Word. You know, everybody has an opinion, right? And they all vary. So, you know... uh, We need something that is solid, something that is rooted, something that is unchangeable to govern our lives, no matter what's going on out there or with styles or whatever it might be, the latest thing. We need to go to the Word. And not only does he go to the Old Testament and quote the Scripture, he also tells them what it means. He tells them exactly in verse 6, he says, they're no longer two people. You you know, how many people really think about that when they're getting married? I know a lot of people that got married, you know why? Because they were lonely. And they found somebody that paid attention to them. And they really needed that attention to make them happy. And perhaps the other party felt the same way. So I'm going to marry you, but I'm going to do it for what you can do for me. I'm going to do it so that you can fulfill my need in my life. A marriage based upon that will never survive. It's exactly the opposite of how God laid it out. Marriage is something where selfishness has to go away permanently. I know, it's a challenge, isn't it? You know, uh, we challenge challenge by it on the human side of things. But when he says that they become one flesh, wow, now we're getting pretty intense here. We're talking some heavy stuff. One flesh. You know, the word uh, in the old uh, King James... Uh, In verse 5, it says, he'll leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. The old King James has the word cleave to his wife. I like that word better because it's more, uh, more expressive. Cleave like with all your might, like you're glued together. And you're not glued together with that milky white water soluble glue. You're, You're glued together with the super glue. You know, the one that holds a car in the air with one drop, right? You're glued. You're cleaving together. You are one. Have you ever had, you know, maybe papers or uh, something like that, and maybe they get a little moist, and and they they stick together, and you try to separate them, and it rips, and half of the one page goes on the other page, and, you know, that was glued together. Right? And when you separate it, it's incomplete. It's flawed. It's, it's no good. And that's exactly what we're looking at here as Jesus talks about joining the wife and the husband to become one flesh. Everything should be shared. I believe that. Because we're one. Why do I have, why do I have to have my own... Uh, financial account? Why do I have to be the one that uh, gets an allowance? We should share things, don't you think? I mean, I I don't know about all of you, but, you know, I I know a lot of folks that say, well, I have my account, and they have their account, and none of our stuff ever crosses, and, you know, well, to me, I look at that, and I think, boy, that is really... Selfish. What happened to dying to myself? Where'd that go? It went out the window. Maybe I forgot about it. Maybe I need to be reminded about it. Because we are no longer two people. We are one. So all of our behavior, all the things that we should do together, should, it should show that we are one. And then, of course, the question comes in, and it's a good question. They came in verse 7, they said, well, if that's the case, then why did Moses command them to have a certificate of divorce and 
put her away. Now, I'm sorry, gals, you're getting picked on here today. Because it's just not about the girls, is it? It's about the guys, too. Right? A guy can get put away, too. A guy can get kicked out or whatever, sent out to pasture, however you want to put it. It works both ways. But during this time, in this culture, women were more like property, more like your mule. And if you didn't like the way your mule's performing, you just get rid of it. Get a better one. And so they're asking a very legitimate question here. If this is a forever thing, when these people cleave together, then why did Moses command a certificate of divorce? Well, first of all, the question has first flaw is the word command. Moses never commanded that. That was a concession. Moses allowed it as a concession, and Jesus is going to tell us why. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted it for you to divorce your, I'll say, spouse here. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. That's not how it was intended. That's how how God designed marriage. Could you imagine if maybe you have a rough week and Jesus comes to you as the bride and says, you know what, I'm sorry, babe, you you didn't live up to my expectations, so I'm going to put you away. I'm going to get rid of you now. He'll never do that, will he? He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And that's why I think marriage is so precious. That's why we do premarital counseling before we do weddings, because we want people to know what a marriage really is in the Bible and how God views it, and how precious and special it is. One more thing that I have to say before we move on here. In verse 4, God made them male and female. Okay? That's the bottom line. You can't change that no matter how hard you try. No matter how much you want to lie to yourself, no matter how much you want to fit in, no matter how much you want your own way, you cannot change this. A man is a man, a woman is a woman, God made them to come together to be one, period. I guess that takes care of all the other stuff that you're wondering if I'm going to say, right? Right? but I don't think it needs to be said. You know, I'm not a kind of guy that wants to condemn people or pick on people or, um, you know, I get critical. I get angry uh, at some of the things I see going on and, and, and I really get frustrated, you know. But at the same time, I, I feel bad. I feel sad. Uh, I feel pity for some of these people because they are so absolutely lost They are in darkness so deep that they can't even conceive of the light. You know, you might even have people in your family that are there. I say pray for them. Don't condemn them. Pray for them. One of the first things that happens when we pray for our loved ones, or for anybody for that matter, is we need to remember that they've been deceived by Satan. It's the devil that's closed their eyes. And I like to think that if I pray and I ask Jesus to bind the enemy in that person's life and to allow them to open their eyes, if they could open their eyes, they would see the truth. But they're so blind that it's almost impossible unless God does it. I'm not going to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. And many, many times, it just brings up so much hatred and anger in our lives. So marriage is very precious in God's eyes. It's a beautiful picture. You know, even in the Old Testament, he refers to the children of Israel as his wife. And he tells his wife, he said, you were unfaithful to me. 
You, you committed adultery on me by going and worshiping other gods. Therefore, you love those gods so much, then we're going to let you move right in with them all for a while. We're going we're to take you into captivity. Our relationship is going to be separated because of you worshiping another God. There is only one God. There is only one Son, one Holy Spirit. And we are not to worship any other. So because of the hardness of your hearts, wow, that's powerful. And then in verse 9, he says the tough one. Whoever divorces his wife, except for adultery, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. Now, I don't see Jesus sitting here saying, and if you do that, then there's no hope for you. If you've done that, then you can't be a Christian. You can't be in ministry. But I think that if we take the whole Word of God, folks, not just a little piece of it here, I can use this little passage right here and beat up a lot of people. But I want to take the whole counsel of God. And though your sins be many, and though your sins be as red, I will wash them away and make them white as snow. And we come to the Lord and we say, God, I am repentant in my heart. I wasn't serving you, Lord. I was selfish. And that relationship was destroyed because of that. And I'm confessing that to you, Lord. And the Lord says, too bad. You broke the rule. Your history, your toast. Is that what he's going to say to you? Or is he going to say, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember that. I'm sorry, I don't remember that because I remember that your sins have been thrown as far as the east is from the west. And I will remember them no more. So why are you bringing something up to me that I don't even remember? It's not just this issue. It's all the issues that we have done that are not according to God's plan. We should feel repentant. We should feel bad about the way those things happened. We should find in ourselves perhaps where the flaw was. And maybe we can come to a place where we can say, well, next time, if I ever have one, I'm never going to be selfish like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love that person. I'm going to let my agenda be their agenda, and we're going to share that together. Um, I know guys that, you know, have their marriages have not survived, and uh, they have a calling on their lives to serve the Lord, maybe in a pastoral way. And so they go, and they, they're searching for a place where they can serve. And one of the first questions that's asked is, have you ever had a failed marriage, and say, yeah, oh, okay, and you're married again, yeah, well, then we can't use you, and they reject them, and they send them down the road, I know that a person that wants to be in ministry has to kind of answer to a higher authority, I suppose, but I still believe in the grace of God, I still believe in the mercy of God, I still believe that God loves us in spite of our failures. I still believe that the washing away is real. And if it's washed away, then it's gone. And we are sitting here this morning justified in his presence. Because you got a new outfit on now. It's not called the self outfit. It's called the Christ outfit. It's called the righteousness of Jesus. And I'm wearing it. And the Father's looking at me, and all of those mistakes, all those failures, all those stupid things that, we, that I did growing up or whatever, he doesn't see them. He doesn't see the gouges and the marks and the bruises and the injuries from what the world has done because of bad choices. He sees this robe that I'm wearing, and it's covering all that up, and he sees the righteousness of Christ. This is the other end, the other side, if you will, of the contract. Not only are we forgiven of our sin, but we are given his righteousness. Think about that. 
It'd be one thing if he went to the cross and forgave us of our sin and then said, okay, you're on your own now. Don't blow it. (laughs) Right? But that's not how it works, is it? That's not how it works with God's grace. So, yes, there is law. But you know what Paul also said? I would would rather see mercy than all of this law. Because you're going to break them. If you break this law, it doesn't matter if you didn't break this law because you broke this one, you're guilty. Doesn't matter which one we broke. We're guilty. All of us are guilty. Maybe not of this particular thing, but we're all guilty of something. So how does God deal with that? Is he up there keeping a record of all your wrongs? Well, I'll tell you what, 1 Corinthians 13 says no. So spouses, listen to this one. Love is a verb, man. Love does. And one of the things it does is it's patient. It's kind. And listen, this is what it doesn't do. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And for us, that's really easy to do. You know, I remember when you were, you know, three years ago when you did such, oh, I got it here in my memos here. I got it written down here, and I'm going to throw that. I'm going to use that as a weapon to beat you down. Or what. That's not what love does. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Neither does God when you're in Christ. That doesn't give us license to just run out and, you know, run amok. Now, I wanted to grab onto this real quick uh, before we finish today, and we may have to pick up on it again next week, but I want to show you something that happens here. He goes on to talk about people who... uh, He says uh, in verse 11, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it's been given. In other words, if you can't can't handle what marriage is about and you don't accept it, then, you know, maybe you should just not get married because in verse 12, there's eunuchs. These are people that were born unable to have children, get married and have children, or they were eunuchs that were made that way by the king or their master, whoever they served in order to keep his harem safe, right? So he'd make these men become eunuchs. Um, And there are men who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. In other words, I would would forsake my privilege of getting married because I want to serve God in this capacity to where I don't want anything that would keep me tied down. I want to be able to be free to go wherever God sends me. And so I can go without being married for him. Okay, well, that's cool. But he says, if you are able to accept it, then that's okay. I'm not. I love being married, having a partner in life. I think it's an awesome thing. I can't imagine trying to be alone and and do, you know, whatever. Uh, But look, look at verse 13. Immediately after this hard teaching... It says little children were brought to him so that he could put his hands on them and pray. And we're also going to see that there is another person that comes to Jesus, and we'll take this up again next week. But this is a rich guy. This is a guy that thinks he has it all together. So on one hand, we have children being brought to Jesus, and on the other hand, we have this guy that feels that he's cool enough to just march right in and bring himself and question the Lord. What do I got to do to be saved? We read a few weeks ago, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like these little children. You must become a little child if you want to enter into the kingdom. You remember when we talked about that? And here we have the same kind of an idea here today. Let the children come to me, verse 14. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. I want to tell you something. You and I might be able to survive a bad marriage. You and I be able to pick up the pieces and move on. But our kids never will. I don't care how hard you try. 
I don't care how many excuses you come up with. I don't care how many things you do to try to cover it. All of us who came from broken homes were affected by that in a negative way, and it carried all the way into adulthood with us. It changes our lives. It changes our children's lives. They're the real victims here. And, you know, I, I say that in preparation for what we're going to speak of next week. But how important it is to protect our kids. You know, here's a guy that comes in and he's kind of self-righteous. He's got money. He's got connections. And he's like, so I got it all. Now what do I got to do to get into heaven? And then here's some kids that are coming and they can't even come to Jesus on their own. They were brought to him. They don't even have the capacity to come to him on their own. But yet he says this, this is what the kingdom is like. This is, this is like the kingdom of heaven. So I want to just say this in closing. Why don't we have the worship team come up? I did not want to come up here and talk about this today. It would have been a lot easier to just move across the book a little bit more. Uh, because I know it might have been sensitive to some of you, and I want you to know that it was never intended to be that way. Matter of fact, I've done my best to be as gracious as possible this morning. But I want you to know that forgiveness of sin is available to us in every area of our lives. Every area. Did you ever steal anything? I mean, maybe not, but I did. Candy bars. You ever go into a store and snatch a candy bar? I mean, we make mistakes. When we're kids, we make them as adults. We sin. So is God going to say, well, you know, the blood of my son, it was good for the candy bar problem, but not for that one. Because you know what the Bible says? It cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. So we're in here this morning, and we're all justified. Right? We've all been called, just as we read about this morning. And we want to live in that. And be blessed in that. And do it right. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for your word. And uh, I just want to pray, God, because I know that there, there are some here this morning who might be struggling in this particular area uh, with what marriage is. And I would just ask you, Lord, that you would show them that selfishness is not part of it. Pride is not part of it. An unwillingness to take responsibility is not part of it. And that you would speak to hearts, God, that you would give hearts forgiveness and grace and mercy, that they would be able to see things from a different perspective, that they would have that heart's desire to say, you know what, we need to forgive one another. We need to move on. We need to serve the Lord. We need to glorify him. And for those, Lord, who are struggling in, in other areas like that, God, I want to pray for them too, that you just hold them up and speak to them this morning, Lord. We're here because we want to do the right thing. We're here not because we have to be here. We're here because we want to be here with you. And we want to hear from you, and we want our lives to reflect you. So I just want to pray, Lord, that you'd help each one of us in those areas selflessness, Christ-centered lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.